perfect teeth and best the skin they get off on bad dust. Two chance with the chest to the letter in Sapiano leather. Oh, 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 oh. Dress to the letter with Sapiano leather. Oh, oh. If you didn't make it go Young and other tits Their own privilege You should be so different Now I don't really mind Anything to feel fine Tired of just existing We're living life The next best thing with my dress Well, we could we could uh, we could move the public here. Sure, we could do that if you want. Well, you'd have to do it at nine thirty. Nine thirty. That's what I'm saying. We could move. We could ask. You could ask for. You guys will be fine. Consent. Here for our weekly board session. It's Wednesday, December 6, 2023. It's 9 o'clock, and we are in the commissioner's boardroom at 555 Court Street, Northeast in Salem. As always, we start with the Pledge of Allegiance, so if you please join me. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. I don't see anybody pu signed up for general public comment. Um, we're going to have another opportunity. If, you ha if you're here for one of the, the um, hearings, the public hearings, at the end of our session, you can sign up over there. Um, since we don't have anyone signed up for general public comment, Commissioner Cameron, we can jump right into our consent agenda. Mr. Chair, I'd be happy to move the consent agenda under Board of Commissioners, Board of Committee Appointments, Public Safety Coordinating Council. Approve orders appointing Marion County Under Sheriff Jay Bergman as a citizen member and Josh Lair as a local, as the local alcohol drug planning committee representative to Marion County Public Safety Coordinating Council in terms ending December 6, 2026. Approve an order appointing myself. Well, I get to actually Big do deal. this. Yeah, there you go. Approve an order appointing Kevin Cameron as chair, Danielle Bethel as vice chair and Colm Willis as second vice chair, which is the most important I say, position I'm, I am really of the Marion County Board chair. of Commissioners to serve from January 2nd, 2024 until first Monday of January, 2025. Under, uh, also under Board of Commissioners, approve a resolution appointing Jan Fritz as the county uh, a county's representative to the Courthouse Square Condominium Association and a memorandum of action electing Jan Fritz and Alan Pollock as directors effective January 1, 2024. Under Human S Health and Human Services, approve amendment number three, the incoming funds in our government agreement with the Oregon Health Authority to add $32,311 for a new contract total of $6,988,936.13 for the following program elements 
through June 30th, 2025, decreasing funding in the amount of $29,098 for PE 03-02 tuberculosis case management and increasing funding in the amount of $61,409 for PE 51-03 American Rescue Plan Act workforce funding. Also under Health and Human Services, approve a contract for the services of a WorkSafe Service, Inc. in the amount of $204,000 to provide urinalysis collection services to five Marion County Specialty Court programs retroactive to July 1st, 2023 through June 30th, 2025. And I will second the motion. We have a motion to second. Is there any further discussion? Seeing that all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Motion passes. And uh, I will be the second vice chair come right. January. Looking forward to that. It's okay. Fun. It's fun being in it's, that It's position. fun not having responsibility. When the other two are gone, right? you can do anything yeah. you want. <laughs> it's fun not having the administrative burden. Okay. Uh, is Anne Marie here? Uh, there you are. Uh, coming up, we're going to consider approval of the intergovernmental agreement with the City of Salem in the amount of $598,982 for one city police officer to co-respond with a mental health professional to provide mobile crisis response services through Marion County retroactive to July 1st, 2023 through June 30th, 2025. Good morning, Anne-Marie. Good morning, Anne-Marie Banfield with um, Health and Human Services. And Ryan showed up too. Yeah, Ryan Matthews, Administrator with Marion County Health and Human Services. Good morning. This contract is a contract that we've had for several years now. We've been doing mobile crisis with co-location in the car since 2014. It's been a very strong program, uh, responding to community members in the, um, that are calling 911 or coming to the attention of law enforcement, providing a uh, officer and a qualified mental health professional to respond in the moment to other uh, law enforcement officers or to 911 calls that are uh, psychiatric emergencies so that we can defer people away from uh, detention or the criminal justice system and really get them the services they need through the crisis center or through other services in the community. How's this program going, Ryan? Oh, it's going well. It's definitely one of the ones Marion County is really proud of. Um, I think that we, you know, we also have to acknowledge that there's potentially some changes coming down the road just in terms of some of the potential contract language changes at the federal level and at the state level around the co-response model with law enforcement. So that's something as a county we've been advocating to continue a model like this. This is something that we're hopeful will continue ongoing. But we do have to acknowledge that at least there are some contract negotiations in play with some of our major funding sources that could att at some point require that we, we take another look at the at how the program is built and put together and, and pivot into a, another path forward. Is there a way that we can not do that if it's going to make the program not work? So I, I think one of the frustrations yeah. that I have is this is a program that works. We talked to Senator Wyden about it, we talked to OHA about it. Um, there are situations that we're not unfamiliar with where it's really important to have a mental health professional and law enforcement co-located and responding to a crisis. Um, yeah. Any progress on that? Well, as you know, the contract negotiations with, with OHA around our, our next uh, mental health agreement have been long in in play here and we still They're don't so have nice. a nice and, and we still don't <laughs> have a contract ready for January 1st 2024 so I think in as long as that remains in limbo and we just sort of keep extending prior language forward uh, there's really nothing in the current or prior language that would prohibit this kind of service and so it, it does give us time to hopefully be able to to make inroads, whether it's with the state legislature or really at the federal level where some of this law was initially written, where hopefully we can get some of that change to uh, you know, allow us to continue to use that funding source to keep this ongoing. Uh, we, we do have some program reserves that we've accumulated over the years in mobile crisis in the early years when we did implementation. Those funds would not have these same restrictions that, that they're trying to put on the new funds. So that can help us with glide paths and with, with looking for you know, potential paths forward. But you know, ultimately, we will need to make sure that uh, that we, we deal with the language at the payer funding level because you know that's how we pay for these services ongoing. So that's something that I know the Public Safety Coordinating Council issued a letter formally so, sort of requesting support to continue this type of arrangement. And we're doing whatever we can with our you know federal advocacy at the federal level and then certainly with our state legislators. So I think we, we can keep attacking kind of those angles, you know, to, to show the value of this and that I think the 
there's sort of some unintended consequences of some of the changes at the federal level where, as you mentioned, Senator Wyden's office never intended to take away something that's working in the community. So uh, that is definitely something that's still a high priority for us because we believe strongly in this model and, and not only safety for the community that we're responding to, but for our, our employees that have to go out into these unknown circumstances and, and really face challenging situations and, and really take comfort in the fact that we've got well-trained law enforcement alongside them to treat people with respect and dignity and, and provide you know the path forward for them that they need. And we've been talking about this for a while. Have you gotten any indication from OHA or, or from Senator Wyden's office that there's openness to keeping this? Or, or is it just sort of like, no, but we'll keep banging on the door? It sounds like it's really driven by the language at the federal level in the American Rescue Plan Act that really forces the hands, the perceived hands of, of those that are receiving that funding down the, the next layer, which would be the state, and then passing on on us. So from their perspective, they're passing on language that they believe is coming to them from the federal level, which seems like that's sort of the primary focus of what we have to do. But, but we, I mean, they've been funding this now for almost a decade. Mm -hmm. So well, the, the I don't ARPA, know why this is, a, why, why all of a sudden now, because they got yeah. more money, they have to screw with our program. Well, unfortunately, a lot of it was built on state funds initially. And so now once they start getting Medicaid match and they start getting federal dollars to sort of build their mobile crisis services, and I think that's where the, the argument could be locally that there really still needs to maintain a state general fund support and state funding to support this model rather than purely have federal funding, which then you have to have the flow down language and requirements at the federal level. Yeah. And those weren't written maybe at the, you know, with, with with our community's needs already in mind. That's again, like that's a national standard that you're talking about, not necessarily what was already built here in Oregon that existed that didn't exist in a lot of communities, right. so. And we and we're, we have some um, different kind of mobile teams that are coming out of PCC that that funding could pay for, right? We do. The new yes. kind of funding. Yeah. Yes. So potentially we could say, all right, use the new funding to pay for the new teams and keep the old funding to pay for the existing teams, right? That would be the best case scenario. Yes. Um, I think one of the things that we really face is we, as Marion County, we have a lot of reasons why we have a lot of persons who need these services, both uh, through our mobile crisis teams with law enforcement and our kinder, gentler teams with their, that are non-law enforcement. Yeah. And so I think that the best case scenario is that we'd be able to have both and we'd be able to fund, you know, do the 24-7 around the clock uh, providing services. The reality is um, about seven years ago, uh, Salem Police did a, a investigation of how many mental health calls they had in a year and it was 26,000. I guarantee you there are more now. The, between the new funding and the old funding, that gives us about 18, so that's not enough to do this work. Mm. They'd have to double that for us to truly be available to respond to every call. That is one of the, the difficulties we face with this new funding and the new structures, is that um, it never seems like they fully fund us to do what they're asking us to do, and the struggle to meet those needs and meet those expectations. But I um, really appreciate the, the relationship that we have developed with our local law enforcement partners. We work with three different agencies. They have really um, learned how to interact with us and how to let us step forward and do the mental health work and provide us with the safety and security to be able to do that well in difficult situations. Um, we are looking for ways with our new teams to be able to support law enforcement in the future should we not have our law enforcement teams still being able to go out and, and respond to them on site, on scene if they need us. So yes, the new teams are, we're looking at a uh, qualified mental health professional, uh, qualified mental health associate and peers to respond. Um, the teams will be responding to a different kind of crisis than we're used to with our local law enforcement. So these are not gonna be 911 calls mostly responding to 988 calls or people who are calling us in the office, which means we're responding to people who have the wherewithal to get help when they need it. That's a very different kind of response than an involuntary 911 call. So I think, we, um, I think both responses will be very helpful. I think that if we can build on those together, it would be a very good way for us to respond to our community and provide the support on site in the moment when people need it. Okay, thank you, Henry. Questions, questions, comments? No, I think uh, the only uh, the only comment I want to make, I think the original grant was a federal grant that we got after visiting. Uh, we went up to Seattle and visited. Uh, that was LEAD. Right. 
Oh, that's right. It was. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I was going to say this was this was really developed with state general yeah. funds initially because it was it was a model that Oregon wanted to try, and I think we were ahead of the game. Yeah. I think it was really well funded, but I also think that there's always the allure and the draw of oh, if we can get federal funds to pay for something that the state general fund was paying for, but that comes with different strings and different rules right. than what we could write locally. And, and but I agree with you. We sat in Senator Wyden's uh, office together, and he did say that it was supposed to be able to be used for that. Right? Absolutely. Yes. Yeah, yeah. I, mean, I wrote this bill. Right. This money will absolutely be able to be used to support your local law enforcement. So, well, yeah. we'll stay on. We'll stay on. It. Literally, we walked out the door, and the staffer comes over and is like, "So, if what the senator says." can't be implemented. Are you open to some flexibility? Oh my gosh. This is why people are cynical about DC. Well, I think one of the things that uh, is difficult is that when they, when they talk about wanting to defer people away from the criminal justice system, they don't think law enforcement can help us do that. And that's very short-sighted in right. how we can partner with them. Yeah. yeah, well said. I actually have a question. So um, I think it seems odd that the county is paying for any services in the city of Salem. And I think I want you to help me understand, rather the public understand, what these two officers do and where they do it, because it's not just in Salem. Right. Uh, so can you talk about that a little bit more? Sure, yeah, I don't know if you wanna talk about how we sort of have shared across the law enforcement partners. It's county Yes, I'd be happy to. So um, from the very beginning, we um, explained that this would be a all county response. And so we do as, Part of the work that we do is part of a, a memorandum that started with the sheriff's office. This is a these teams respond throughout the county, and so it's not just a Salem response. It is a spawn, uh, any team that's on. They make sure that they alert Metcom, which is the north part of the county's 911 service, as well as uh, uh, Lamont Valley, which is here in the major metro area. And so they will respond all over the county, all the way up the canyon. They've been to Detroit. They've been to Aurora. They've been to St. Paul. Uh, wherever we get that call, all four teams respond depending on which team is on. So how do they respond? What's it look like I, if I was to call? I can tell you. Well, I know you can, but I really I, like them too. I, well, <laughs> I, I want to I share this because I was on a ride along with Sergeant Hickam probably four or five years ago. I don't know. How, when did we start this program? In 2014. Okay, so it must have been 2015 or 16. Mm -hmm. We did 100 miles an hour up the freeway to Aurora. And uh, it was a domestic violence uh, complaint, and he handled it with his mental health training. Um, and then as I'm standing there, here comes a Salem police car pulling up with the mental health person in the car. So Salem police responded to Aurora. And that's the way the program's been designed. And if Woodburn was on, because Woodburn's one of our partners, yes, Woodburn, 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 Woodburn would have been there. And we tried to get the, the coverage. We have four teams or three? We have four. 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 Yeah. So that's, I mean, I actually witnessed it on a ride along with one of our sheriffs. Well, that's so why I know that they, I actually, I know how it happens, but that didn't answer my question. I, I can answer your Thank question. You. So um, there's a couple of different ways that a team might be called out. One is through a 911 call. So they let the Metcom and, and Willamette Valley know they're on. If the dispatcher realizes it's really a mental health call, they will call these teams to respond. There's always a cover officer as well in case something goes sideways. So you have the initial contact and then our teams come in. We provide a mental health evaluation and we assist with de-escalating that situation. 50% of the time we're able to do that in the community. It could be a um, transport to the psychiatric crisis center for sur uh, further evaluation and services. Or if the person's in some serious need, it could be a transport to the um, Salem Hospital emergency room for further evaluation and potentially hospitalization. So that's one route. Another route is an officer could be out on a call and realize they're really dealing with mental health um, concerns that are really beyond their skills. And so then they can call the team to come out as well. The teams also spend a great deal of time answering the phones from other officers who are on site, they're in a situation, and they're looking for some direction or support. They take literally dozens of those calls every day. And then the, finally, sometimes things go on at the crisis center and we may call and say, hey, could you go check on this for us? Or it might be a, a welfare check from another agency and they may say, is mobile crisis on? Could they go out and check on this person? So those are the various ways that mobile crisis is, um, is initiated and dispatched. Okay. Thank you, that's super helpful. I think it's important that people understand, yes, we do respond, but like, how does that really happen? And I, it's the component of the 911 call and or whatever the new number might, what is it, 888? 988. 988. If anybody ever catches on to that, well, we've been talking about it for two years and I can't remember it. Uh, I think we need a lot more of these teams 
-hmm. And I'm frustrated at the state specifically for the challenges that they're putting in our way to be able to continually fund this. I know it's a uh, value added service in Salem specifically. We see them downtown often. Uh, our, part, our community partners rely on them for safety and access. Dan Clem is in the audience from UGM. I look at him and he's <laughs> shaking his head. Uh, I think that there's also a lot of narrative around having officers respo respond to what's a health related situation in a negative context and I think that that stigma just really needs to go away and I think people who don't like it need to spend time with it to really appreciate it because there's not one QMHA that we employ that doesn't value and want to be in the car with those officers because there isn't a call that they go to now that they don't need protection. Uh, more often than not, folks are in some type of extreme crisis that leads to violent behavior. And why would a, why would a healthcare provider want to put themselves in harm's way? Um, they do, but now they can do it safely with their partner, and I'm really grateful for it. And thanks for indulging me. I'm sorry I'm late today. <laughs> no problem, but we do need a motion. Yeah. <laughs> All right, I move to approve the intergovernmental agreement with the City of Salem in the amount of $598,982 for one city police officer to co-respond with a mental health professional and provide mobile crisis response services through Marion County retroactive to July 1, 2023 through June 30th, 2025. I'll second the motion. We have a motion a second. Is there any further discussion? Yes, actually, I, is this one officer or two? Because the contract states two. So for clarification, it's for two city police officers to co-respond. Thank you for catching that. Right, yeah. yeah, it's two teams comprised how this is written. That's right, so two yeah. officers. It just, the agenda description right. is wrong, but the contract itself is correct. Yeah. Okay, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Aye, aye. the motion passes. Thank you very Thank much. You, Thank right. you. Thank you. Is Christina here? Oh, there she is, you were hiding. Good morning. Uh, we're going to consider approval for contract for services of the Public Partnerships LLC in the amount of a million dollars to provide fiscal intermediary services retroactive to October 1st, 2023 through July 1st, 2026. Good morning. Uh, good morning, Commissioners. Um, this contract, uh, we've been working with. I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. Christina Berti, Program Supervisor for Health and Human Services, um, here to talk about our. Um, to consider approval with a contract with PPL. Um, we've been working with PPL for many years. Um, they are our in fiscal intermediary service that process um, rental payments for individuals who have health challenges so they may achieve their highest um, level of health and well-being. Um, PPL provides a web portal that allows us to upload um, providers' payment information within 72 hours. Um, the system pays providers directly, either by check or an automated clearinghouse. Um, they've been a great partner uh, in the last four years um, and beyond that. Um, and we're currently processing approximately 60 um, rent payments per month, um, but this contract can support growth, um, which we're anticipating within the next year. Um, and it ensures that um, everyone on our caseload, um, that, that timely payments are made, and that we can maintain partnerships with these property managers and landlords. All right. Any questions? No, I think this is super valuable. Super I agree. Keep people in their homes. Thank you. Commissioner Cameron, anything? Ready for a motion? I'm ready for a motion. Right. Mr. Chair, I'll move that we approve contract for services with Public Partnerships LLC in the amount of $1 million to provide fiscal immediator services retroactive to October 1st, 2023 through July 31st, 2026. We second the motion. We have a motion and a second. Is there any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Thank, Thank, you. You Thank you. Thank you. Have a good day. Okay. Uh, next up, we have Brandon Reich. Oh, no, we don't. We have Austin. Uh, there you go. We're going to consider adoption of an administrative ordinance to amend the Marion County Rural Zone Code, Chapter 17, to permit accessory dwelling units in acreage residential zone. Good morning. Good morning, Commissioners. So, yes, before you today um, is an ordinance 
uh, to permit accessory dwelling units in the acreage residential zone. Um, there's re been recent legislative changes that allow the county to permit accessory dwelling units, otherwise known as ADUs, in the acreage residential zone. This comes from Senate Bill 644. Um, staff brought a discussion about initiating the amendments to management update on July 11th, 2023, and the board initiated consideration of the amendments on September 13th, 2023. On October 25th, 2023, the board held a public hearing to consider the amendments and receive testimony. The board approved the amendments and directed staff to prepare an ordinance for its consideration. Last week, the board scheduled adoption of the ordinance for today. And I will uh, stand for any questions you may have. Any questions for Austin? Good news. It's pretty straightforward. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, and I will take a motion, Commissioner Bassett, if you're ready. I uh, move to adopt administrative ordinance to amend Marion County Rural Zone Code Chapter 17 to permit accessory dwelling units in the acreage residential zone. I'll second the motion. Do a motion a second. Is there any further discussion? Seeing Jane. I think we have to <laughs> okay. Uh, in the matter of amending the Marion County Rural Zone Code, Chapter 17, to permit accessory dwelling units in the acreage residential zone. In the matter of amending the Marion County Rural Zone Code, Chapter 17, to permit accessory dwelling units in the acreage residential zone. So, um, Jane, are we adopting this by emergency? No, you only have to read it by title. Right, that's what oh, I thought. Which is fine, but okay. so the second time is even better. That's good, yeah, yeah. just to make sure. <laughs> okay. So we're not, I just wanted to clarify, we're not adopting this by emergency. Okay. Right. okay. But I have a motion and a second, so we can vote on the motion. Okay. Right. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 The motion passes. Okay. Austin, you're still here. Mm -hmm. We're going to consider adoption of administrative ordinance approving zone change comprehensive plan ZCCP case number 23-001 Pacific Beavers and Land Company LLC. Yes, so again, before you today is consideration for adoption of administrative ordinance, approving zone change slash comprehensive plan change, ZCCP 23-001 for Pacific Beaverton Land Co. LLC. The Marion County uh, Hearings Officer held a duly noticed public hearing on May 11th, 2023, and issued a recommendation of approval on July 21st, 2023. The board held a duly noticed public hearing on the application on September 13th, 2023 and considered all the evidence in the record and approved the request. The ordinance and findings have been prepared and the notice of adoption was given on November 29th, 2023. The administrative ordin ordinance is now set for formal adoption. And again, I'm here to answer any questions you may have. Any questions on this one, commissioners? Good. This just implements a decision that... Right. This yeah. is it, right? You approve the zone change, now we're just doing the ordinance. Okay, great. I will take a motion. Mr. Chair, I'll move that we adopt an administrative ordinance approving zone change comprehensive plan ZCCP case number 23 001, <coughs> Pacific Beaverton Land Company, LLC. I'll second the motion. We have a motion and a second, and the title of this one is In the Matter of the Application of Pacific Beaverton Land Co. LLC. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 The motion passes. Thank you, Austin. Thank you, guys. Okay. And uh, now I am going to. Oh, oh. Get two minutes. Oh. We're going to go into recess for two minutes. You're going to have a bathroom break. And then uh, when we come back, I'm going to open a public hearing. Perfect. We're adjourned. Not adjourned. In recess. Excuse me. <laughs>
And I'm going to open a public hearing to consider substantial amendment number three to the fiscal year 2021-2022 annual action plan under the Federal Community Development Block Grant and Home Investment Partnership Program to add the Union Gospel Mission Samanka Place renovation project. I feel like confetti should fall from the sky or something right now. Good I'm morning, very excited Steve. about this discussion. <laughs> Good morning, Commissioners. I'm Steve Dickey, CDBG and Home Program Manager for Community Services. And today we are bringing to you a, a request to amend the 2021-22 uh, Annual Action Plan. Uh, what this amendment does, is it allows us to move funds that were allocated into the category of supportive services to add additional funds to the construction category in that grant uh, for the purpose of being able to fund a renovation project for the Samanka Place uh, Women's and uh, Family Shelter in Kaiser that's operated by the Union Gospel Mission. Uh, when we received these uh, home funds from HUD, the area, um, American Rescue Plan, or um, commonly referred to as Home ARP, uh, in order to secure those funds, we had to make our best estimate of how we would allocate those funds to likely projects coming in. And that's why we allocated the dollar amounts into supportive services and a dollar amount into construction. Fully understanding that once we had actual projects coming forward for those, we would likely be uh, having to bring a, an amendment forward. And that is what we are doing today. Um, and so the the, this is an administrative process. We are, uh, will be bringing back the, the contract uh, probably within the next two meetings scheduled for the, the Board of Commissioners for your approval, the actual approval of the contract uh, to move forward with this project. And I would entertain any questions. Any questions, Steve? Oh, I don't have any questions, but I've got all kinds of thoughts. Okay. Well, I just think, one, it's been a really difficult process to be able to get CDBG up and going. And I think most people, in Marion County, most residents that live here have no idea even what it is and how impactful it is to the service-based systems that we have here. And when we can make this kind of a, a shift in this program to make an investment in an organization like Samanka House, um, we're really literally changing people's lives and making generational impacts, which is why the previous Board of Commissioners, in my opinion, applied to become an entitlement county so we could access these federal dollars. While it is taxpayer dollars as a whole, these funds, in my mind, do not create a local burden to be able to, for us to spend them the way we're spending them. Uh, and it's taken, I think, all year for us to get to this conversation today. UGM had some planning to go through, um, but anybody that walks around Salem or Woodburn or navigates in the areas of the forest knows that we have a homeless crisis on our hands. And women and children are the most vulnerable of those populations. And this investment is going to go change the lives of those women and children. Um, and the children is obviously my biggest focus because I think we have to be able to uh, remove the barrier for them to really see what life looks like so they can improve overall and work hard to get out of the circumstance and break that generational um, whatever it is. And this is going to do that. So thanks, Steve, for navigating this process uh, on our behalf, and thanks to the commissioners for being very supportive of what this is going to get our community. Yeah, thank you. I have two people signed up for public comment. Uh, Kathy, do you want to come and tell us a little bit about this project? <clears throat> I'm very happy to be talking to you today. Um, commissioners, thank you so much for the consideration of the women and children who are in dire need in our county. Um, I have been working for UGM for 16 years at Samanka Place for 14 of those 16 years. And in the course of that time, I have seen the demographics, the picture of homelessness for women and children change drastically. First off, when I first started working, um, Samanka Place was really a, a shelter for single women. There were so many opportunities for women with children um, funded by the state. Then about I, like eight years or so ago, all of that state funding dropped out. And so UGM, uh, this is one reason why I love working for UGM, they're always forward thinking. 
Uh, and so we just decided what can we do with our limited resources to serve these women and children who yesterday had housing, had shelter, and today have nothing. And so we have um, used a building that was built never intending to serve children of any kind, um, serving um, up to um, eight families. Uh, we are able to serve eight families every night. What has happened in the course of just the last five years, the, ne the need for shelter for women with children has increased exponentially. We are now serving three to four, or we're seeing the need to serve three to four times the number of women with children that we were serving just three years ago. And there is no place to put them in our building. It's very unfortunate that just last month alone, we were unable to serve 25 children. And there's really not a lot of other resources for women with children in um, Marion County for, uh, for homeless women and children. And another demographic that we have seen increase three times in the last, five, um, in the last three years has been the number of elderly women um, it's just been heartbreaking to see these women who had um, had their homes for their entire life, and now they are in their senior citizen years unhoused and finding themselves with nowhere to be but on the street, and again, with very limited resources for them. So we want to, to uh, develop a, a way to be able to serve those women and then you all know about the increased needs for mental health supports. Um, what we have um, been doing the last year with JD Health and Wellness in our building, we have been able to bring in women with more severe mental health issues, allow them the opportunity to stabilize, and then be able to engage in our programs and move forward into a productive community life. And um, we want to be able to provide that opportunity for more women. So this project, <laughs> it sounds like it's a pretty grand plans, and it really is, but we really want to be able to serve women who are not being served right now, children who are not being served right now, and that's what this plan is, is all about. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, Dan, Mr. Chair, if yeah. I may make a comment, Kathy, thank you for thank you for mentioning the you're fine, but mentioning the <laughs> senior issue. Uh, I was at a United Way board meeting last night, and uh, the senior cottages that United Way is working on will be open probably this spring. So, uh, and that was one of the areas that um, has been identified as one of the highest at risk becoming homeless is mm -hmm. senior, but based on inflation and being on fixed income. So that'll be a nice complement to some of the struggles that we're facing uh, with senior population. So thanks for bringing that up. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, come on, Dan. Mr. Chair and fellow commissioners, uh, my name is Dan Clem. I'm the executive director for Union Gospel Mission. Uh, almost seven years now and, and just blessed every day of it. We're requesting funds for renovation of Samanka Place to accomplish two primary purposes. The first is to remodel the interior space to enable Samanka Place to better meet the needs of an increasing population of women with children and families and to address the needs of women experiencing mental health crisis who need their own space for initial recovery. We call that stabilization. It's part of trauma-informed care of which uh, an ex uh, a remodeled facility will help us be able to do and be able to help more ladies in that, in that with those issues. In doing so, the rooms for the project are designed to accommodate larger families of up to eight with each room having its own private bathroom. All rooms will be equipped with private bathroom to eliminate the need to share a bathroom with occupants of the other rooms. During the renovation, additional features will be added to the facility to also address some of the physical challenges of older women seeking help at Samanka Place. These can include handrails, modifications to better accommodate mobility devices and ramps to replace stairs. The second purpose of this project is to address the overall condition of the facility that is over 60 years old. 
I, I will tell you in the last three years I've had to, if, through the generous donations from several people and our donors, uh, almost had to put a, had to put almost $100,000 into just making sure the roof doesn't leak, making sure the plumbing works. It's an older facility. These ladies deserve a place that looks like a home and with their children be able to have play space for the kids. Right now it's hallways. I'm painting a dire picture because that's exactly what it is. But we want to make this a place where they can feel at home, have space for their children, get the mental health help that they need, stabilize, and to be able to serve the more aging population that's coming in our door with no other options. Yes, the intention is to address the HVAC, the roofing, the lighting, the floor covering, siding, windows. These improvements are needed to maintain the safe and efficient function of the facility and to enable it to continue providing services to the community. We, we look forward to a, a partnership with Marion County with uh, being able to make this facility what it should be, what the ladies deserve. And uh, we've, we've gone through the details to understand the separation of religious activities and non-religious activities in terms of the funding. So uh, we're excited about uh, being able to do more because more is needed. I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Dan. I'm good. Okay. I like this. I just think it's super important to say that uh, Smoky House is always taking donations. <laughs> it's coming up on the end of the year. So if you want to make a charitable contribution, I highly recommend doing it and making these tax dollars go further to make a bigger impact or the biggest mm -hmm. impact possible. And if people have never been to Smunka House, I would highly encourage you to take a look at it. Because you drive by it on River Road and Kaiser just about every single day and people don't know that it's there. Uh, which I'm glad that they don't know that it's there because yeah. I want it to be kept quiet and peaceful. But I also think it's important to market the opportunity for safety and security that that I believe in is most important. So, mm -hmm. Thank you. Like and I, just, I want to say thank you for all your work on this project. I know this is... Uh, you personally have done a lot of work to, to get this project this far. So I want to say thank you for that. Um, because as much as we have this program and we can invest in good projects in our community, we can only invest if there are projects that are happening in our community. <laughs> and so um, you deserve some, some gratitude for that. We're all God's children. So. That's it. Is there anybody else who would like to uh, make public comment on this before we close the public hearing? Do you have anything else, Steve, for us? Uh, nothing before this now. Okay. Commissioners, is there anything else you'd like to add? No. Okay. Then I will close uh, the public hearing to amend, uh, to consider a substantial amendment number three to the fiscal year 2021-2022 annual action plan under the CDBG and the Home Investment Partnership Programs to add Union Gospel Mission to Monka Place Renovation Project. And I am going to open a public hearing. Do you to want to take the action? Yeah, do you want to just jump to the uh, next We have to go back into action. You can go into action. Do you want to go into action? Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, then I will go back into action and we'll consider a resolution to approve the substantial amendment number three for fiscal year 21 22 annual action plan under the CDBG and Home Investment Partnerships Program to add Union Gospel Mission Samanka Place Renovation Project. So moved. <laughs> Good. I'll second the motion that he just <laughs> you made. You heard the whole thing. Perfect. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Is there any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Motion passes. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Dan. So now I will open a public hearing to consider proposed changes to the solid waste collection rates charged by franchise haulers within the unincorporated areas of Marion County. Who's, oh, there we go. Dennis and Brian. Come on up. All right, bear with me as I open up our PowerPoint. <clears throat> Good morning, everybody. Um, Brian May, Public Works Environmental Services Division Manager. And I'm Dennis Mansfield, Deputy Public Works Director. All right, and uh, today, um, I'm a, a little defuddled. Uh, very, very happy to hear um, the work that was just done. Much appreciated. Um, as part of that, uh, we have a a very kind of, I'll say, stale process we go through. It's called our cost of service analysis for our, our haulers. And I want to shed a little light on that. And um, this is a service that's provided 
to all of the members of Marion County residents, businesses, et cetera, right? It's, it's one of those things that we kind of take for granted. When we push that card out to the curb every day, it disappears and it's taken care of. And I just want to thank them for the services they provide and the solutions they provide for us and not being a problem for us on a daily basis where we don't have issues that arise from people not having their garbage collected or, or the recyclables taken care of. But I just want to, just want to kind of step into that. So um, as another piece of that, normally we'd have our rate consultant, uh, Chris Bell, with us today. Um, he had a tragic uh, death in the family on Monday morning. So Dennis has graciously stepped in to pitch hit for us. So kind of bear with us as we kind of take you through this kind of stale process of a lot of numbers, uh, but for good reasons. So. Yes. Mr. Chair, yeah. he, he said stale twice. Yeah. Does it, does it have anything to do with what we're talking about? No, not at all. Oh, okay. <laughs> stale process. Good morning, commissioners. Thank you for your time this morning. Um, it is a little odd as I'm going off of uh, Chris Bell's notes and kind of, you know, he was very intimate with this process and is every year. Um, so I've been trying to ad lib with that. So again, bear with me through this. Um, uh, waste and recycling collection services are provided to Marion County's uh, residential and commercial customers mm -hmm. through an exclusive franchise system where eight private collection companies are assigned exclusive service territories. As the regulator of waste and recycling, the Marion County commissioners are responsible for ensuring reasonable and adequate rates to provide necessary public service. There are three collection services provided within the county, CART, primarily for residential customers, container, which is offered to commercial customers, and roll-off drop-off service. The Environmental Services Division of the Public Works Department completes an annual rate review. The franchise companies submit an annual report to the county that provides detailed costs and revenues associated with providing service within their franchise territory and combined total company operations. The report format provides the capacity to calculate the cost of service for each line of business, cart, container, and drop box. Reported results were analyzed and the following tasks were completed by Bell & Associates, the county's contracted solid waste rate consultant. Analyze and compare the reports, reported route collection hours to the reported customer counts for each line of business. Using a predictive test of revenue for each line of business, ensuring the revenues are reasonable for the number of reported customers. By thoroughly reviewing the reported direct cost line items, determine if the expense is reasonable in relation to the customer and operational data entered from the detailed cost reports. Utilize a predictive test of disposal, determine if the reported disposal expense is reasonable. Using the reported administrative line items, determine if the expense is reasonable for the operational da data entered from the detailed cost report and review the cost between the county and the company's other franchise collection operations to determine if the allocations are reasonable. The results of the operations are summarized on this next slide. Note at the bottom there, the return on revenues for 2022 uh, was 4.83% for rural. Um, urban uh, was 9.25% and the composite of that is 6.58%. Um, I do want to note that this is considered uh, earnings before income taxes, known as EBIT. Um, that means this is before they actually pay their income taxes. Um, once the reports were reviewed and adjustments made, estimating the financial performance for 2023 was completed by applying the following assumptions to the 2022 adjusted expenses. Driver wages escalated by 5%. Health insurance premiums increased by almost 16%. Um, fuel costs did decrease by 9.5% from 2022. Commingle recycling processing increased 60.3%, primary, primarily due to the slowing economy. Other expenses influenced by inflation were increased by 4.3%. To set uniform collection rates, the county is segregated into two regions, urban, located within the Salem urban growth boundary, and the rest of the unincorporated county, identified as rural. For reporting purposes, the financial results of all three services are combined to generate a composite report. However, setting collections rate at or near the cost of service for all three service types is the objective of the county. 
This slide summarizes the increased cost by region and the percentage increase to the respective expense used to calculate the rates. The estimated increase at the bottom of the table is expected to increase compared to the total cost of collection operations for each region. Financial data was consolidated by service showing, uh, excuse me, I'm sorry, back up a second. Yes, there we go. Um, uh, in January 1st, 2023, uh, so last year, the board did uh, re uh, approve rate increases. There was 2.8% for cart collection services in the urban area. In the rural region, 1.1% for cart collection services. And then with container, we had two year increases for small uh, containers, the one, one and a half and two yard, an average of about 17% per year. And then drop box increases for haul and zone rates about an average of 10% um, last year. Financial data was consolidated by service showing the collection systems, total revenues and expenses. This consolidated report allows the calculation of the system's return on re revenue and provides a measure of the adequacy of rates. The slide summarizes the estimated 2023 return for each collection service provided within the county's collection region. The, um, within the urban region, uh, the return on revenues for roll cart is 5.6%, um, container is 12.5%, Dropbox at 10.7% with a composite of 7.9%. Um, and with projected 2023 rural region rates, the return on revenues for rural cart is 7.3%, container at 0.8%, Dropbox is showing a loss of a half a percent, and composite of 4%. The urban cart rates, the cart services pulls down the composite while container services partially subsidizes the urban uh, operations. As such, county staff is recommending a 4.9% increase to cart service. On the rural cart um, rates, county staff is recommending a 3.7% increase to the cart service. And on rural containers, last year the commission had approved increases to the rural collection services rather rates for smaller containers over two years. We are noting fuel and labor expenses for commercial collections are expected to rise in 2024. And so that, as such, county staff is recommending a 1.5% increase to container services. Next slide, Brian. On medical waste, um, rates for medical waste collections were last adjusted by the commissioners in 2019. Since then, materials like medical boxes, labor, and collection expenses have increased by 12.6%, and disposal is scheduled to increase by 71% from $87.45 a ton to $150 per ton, which takes effect on January 1, 2024. Um, this slide summarizes the revenue expenses for the two service levels provided within Marion County. You'll notice a heavy and low. Um, that is defined by the uh, number of boxes. A heavy customer disposes of approximately, or 60 boxes or more per month. Um, it is county, county staff recommendation to uh, a 17% increase to heavy customers and a 5% to low customers. Hey, any questions, Commissioners? I'm not sure it's a question, maybe more of a statement. I was, um, at, again, United Way, what's that got to do with garbage? But I was talking to one of my good board members, uh, Mr. Truitt, and he lives at Illahi, and he lives in the county, and on one side of the street, somebody's paying $17.96, and on the other side of the street, somebody's paying $21 at DNO. Right? We, we're cheaper in the county. Why is that? Can you Good answer governance. that, Brian? Uh, there's a, there, there's I a, mean, the same truck's going down the street, right? Yeah, there's a couple factors that play into there. One being is the franchise rate that's charged by jurisdiction. So in Marion County, we charge a 3% franchise rate, and City of Salem charges a 7% franchise rate. Wait, can you say that again? <laughs> so, so, so we charge 3% franchise rate, Correct. and the City of Salem Charges, charges 7%. 7%. Yes. Why is that? Uh, is that? That's a policy they set? They've chose to do that, yes. Okay, just wanted to, I wanted to make sure. And a franchise rate, to be clear, it is wasn't the money the, that, the, money that the government gets, right? It's like a tax on the haulers, essentially. Correct. Right. right. Yep. That, 
it helps so, serves our solid waste fund. Yes. So our tax on the haulers is, is less than half of what Salem's tax on the haulers is. Is that correct? Right? Oh, you want to see my property tax data? No. no. And the guy that lives across the street? Man, you're choosing to live in Salem. That's all I got to say. I choose to live in the unincorporated areas of Marion County for a reason. There's I know. lots of I did. For I did for 20 years, too. Yeah, so um, this is uh, not like the easiest thing in the world for a commissioner to do, to be able to make a decision to take taxpayer dollars and... Uh, give them to a business like this is a very unique model and I think it's important that every time we do this we give some small education as to what the unique opportunity is here why it's a healthy opportunity for our residents what the control mechanism looks like um, you know when we did this last year we took in some well several complaints from residents because the cost of living is difficult especially for seniors and people in poverty, single family homes. Um, and uh, I want to make sure that we're providing them as much information as possible, bef you know, when we're, we're in this space. We understand it. You guys spend all the time with me. But I really need for there to be just a, an understanding provided, a, an education provided as to what, because Lane County and Marion County are very different, right, in how the, the trash is um, managed. I wouldn't say haul because it's kind of the same trucks and it goes to a transfer station. But uh, can you talk a little bit about the franchise system here and what the value of this system is for the residents of Marion County and why we should continue in this space? You, you betcha. I, and I kind of started a little bit. I apologize, you stepped out. But um, it's it's that aspect and in, in the way I evaluate our system. I'm very proud of our, our integrated solid waste system in a sense that every day when you put your cart out, your container, it, it, it's taken care of, right? Um, within our franchise, our, our holders of those do not have a choice to start with. If, if somebody needs service, they get service. Um, in other counties, that's not the choice. They can refuse to provide service. Uh, we wanna make sure that everybody has that same right uh, to have their garbage collected. You get into then kind of that uh, health standpoint of consistent collection of garbage so that we don't have garbage piling up in our streets, so to speak, or in the back 40, or being burned on a regular basis and, and creating other issues. Um, having that consistency of the franchise and the consistency, in a sense, of that rate of return to make sure that those trucks run every day, those carts are collected every day, and it's a consistent thing that we just depend on. When we push the cart out, it's not a question of whether that's gonna get picked up today. It's gonna happen, and you're almost setting your clock to that aspect of it. So it's a, it's, one, a security and comfort level, but it's also that health side that really stands out for me. At the beginning when I stepped out, did you talk about um, the impact? I mean, I know that you ran through it, but the impact over the last year on the, on the business. I mean, every, I own a business, so I've seen the impact of inflation and the cost of services and the lack of, of uh, want because people can't afford it. Um, and some of these are pretty substantial hikes specifically in the medical waste space, right? And I'm not necessarily so concerned about a hospital calling me on the phone and, and talking about it, but clinics and folks across the smaller level of our system are gonna see a pretty significant increase, especially if they're high producers. Um, anyway, did you talk about at the beginning what it looks like for the evaluation that's done by Chris and his team? and how we look at records and we understand the bottom line of each of these businesses and it's not just assumed we don't, while they're all lovely human beings and <laughs> full of integrity, we do our due diligence to make sure that we're not just paying them to pay them. Exactly, that was the probably the second part of how I should have answered Commissioner Cameron's question about what's the difference between the city of Salem per se and, and the county as far as it's just not the franchise rate. Um, we do take the time and investment with a Chris Bell to come through and, and our haulers with us today can tell us it's an extensive 11 month process to go through. Um, and we dive deep into the books and we verify and we, we remove costs, we evaluate costs, we look at future costs and, and how do we provide services so that it's not just 
uh, take it for granted and we move on and we say yes, go forth. So there's a very in-depth process in, in that evaluation of just analytics and then literally diving into financial statements to make sure that everything is fair, again, back to the public to make sure that they're paying for a, a quality service at a reasonable rate. Thanks, Brian. Mm -hmm. I do want to say to the haulers that are here, for the most of you who are really participatory in the process that we impose on you, thank you for the transparency and the partnership. I think it's super important. I understand it's uncomfortable to open your books as a business owner to a government entity. <laughs> uh, but I wouldn't make a decision, a, a positive decision, if I didn't have thoughtful information. Um, because I take this job very seriously and the money that is going to come out of the homes of our individual residents across the county to support their trash service and your business um, is something that I think I only learn more about every single time we do this. This is only my third year as a commissioner, second time we've, I've been down this road and this has been a very extensive process, probably painful for staff because I have really drilled them and really worked to be educated on the decision I'm making today. So. Thank you all, and thanks for being here today, sp spending the morning with us until we got to this public hearing. Great. Um, do you have anything else, Mr. Cameron? Just thank you for the service. It, it, and and uh, I know I think the other county that's ahead of us cheats, but um, for, for the, uh, the results that uh, our haulers and our staff have, and the citizens of Marion County have trying to get things out of the waste stream, I know we have challenges, tremendous challenges ahead of us. And uh, as you say, the public doesn't understand, but that's the decisions that we have to make along with these business people all the time to, to see how we can um, continue to serve, uh, you know, 350,000 citizens in Marion County uh, and things that we take for granted. And we really do. And you, you, you can only go back a few years and think of strikes in different places where garbage piles up on the street corner and rats and all that stuff. We don't have that here. And uh, thank you, Brian, Dennis, and, and those that are um, working and uh, all your employees that work every day that are out there right today in the, in the stormy weather. Um, really appreciate everybody that makes that happen. Thank you. I don't so, have anybody else sign up so, for public comment. Is there anybody here who would like to make a comment before we close this hearing? So, okay. Mr. Chair, I'll move that we close the public hearing and approve an increase to the solid waste collection <coughs> rates charged by franchise haulers within the unincorporated areas of Marion County as referenced in Exhibit A. I know we're doing, we've been juggling all day, but Jane asked me to separate these two motions. So. Why don't we close the public hearing first and then we'll make a motion under action. That's at the request of our legal counsel. Is that okay? That's new business to me. <laughs> <laughs> then I will close this public hearing and reopen our uh, action agenda. And now I'll take a motion. So Mr. Chair, I'll move that we approve an increase in the solid waste collection <laughs> rates charged by franchise haulers within the unincorporated areas of Marion County as referenced in Exhibit A. I second the motion. We have a motion and a second. Is there any further discussion? I think the only thing that I would say for the record is I also appreciate all the work that's been done on our solid waste system, both from staff and the haulers. Um, and for the public, uh, part of what we're doing is we're catching up. So we've had some inflation over the last couple of years, and um, we haven't had rate increases. And that's really been a benefit to folks. But if we want our system to continue, um, our haulers have to be able to pay the drivers, and they have to be able to buy the trucks, and they have to be able to actually get people out to, out to our homes. So part of what we're doing here and that's part of the reason why uh, we have to approve these rate increases so any further discussion I would just say that we're always available to have conversations and also I would just like to offer the opportunity to the haulers to have a conversation about creative marketing to really incentivize the residents of Marion County to be better about their waste uh, it's always concerning to me. In fact, I just met with Dennis and Brian yesterday, and I'm the uh, 3R generation, the reduce, reuse, recycle. Yes, I know, John Sullivan, that is not the way of the world anymore. But whatever, it was an effective campaign for my seven-year-old mind, and I still remember it. My point is, is we should do that again. Whether it's that or something else resources come up with, we're not doing a good enough job in the county and I believe our partners need to participate in that, of really educating the generations next 
<laughs> the younger ones, to be better, to understand that you have to rinse out your milk jugs before you put them in the commingle recycle and what the hell is a commingle recycle. So things like that. <laughs> Any further discussion? <laughs> yes, I said that on the record. I don't care. <laughs> All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 The motion passes. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you, commissioners. Thank you. Okay, so that does it for our uh, agenda. Is there anything else for the good of the order? Oh, Commissioner Bethel, would you like to vote on the consent agenda? Yes, please. Okay, then uh, is there any objection, Commissioner Cameron? No, Mr. Chair, I'll support that. Okay, without objection, then, uh, Commissioner Bethel, how do you vote on the consent agenda? Aye. Did you get that, Brenda? Commissioner Bethel votes aye in favor of approving the consent agenda. Okay, is there anything else? No, I gotta go get my garbage. <laughs> I missed, I forgot to take it out. I put mine out today, in the rain. All Thanks. right, we are adjourned. Thanks everybody.